Today, Pastor Bo is out of town. He's in Portugal, and he's actually spending some time training pastors over there to do kind of what we do, but in their culture, and to love Jesus and to lead their people well. So please be praying for him. He'll be coming back this week. In the meantime, today, we've talked about already, we're doing baptisms, which is really cool. I'm really excited that I get to do that. I love the, the topic of baptism. I love when we get to do that. It's such a neat experience and a neat thing that uh, it really displays what Christianity is in a picture form. So it can help us to understand what Jesus did for us, who we are now. And so I want to read some scripture that I think can, can kind of help us to understand. We're going to look in John chapter 3 in a passage that you're going to be pretty familiar with. If you want to follow along there in your pew Bibles, this is page 814. Please feel free to take those. If you need a Bible at home, feel free to take one home. Um, but we want to talk about the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. And this man, Nicodemus, is a really interesting guy. He was a religious leader. And so for the Jewish people, like he was the one that should know everything about everything that is about God. He's the one that should be close to God. He's the one that should know God, that he should know what God wants. And isn't that a question that we have? God, what do you want? What is it that you want from me? Once we realize that there is a God and that he has intentions for us, what is it that you want? And so he scheduled a meeting with Jesus, this kind of rebel, um, strange prophet, teacher, man who was traveling the country, who wasn't, he didn't build a synagogue, he just wandered around and he, he taught crowds and did all this crazy stuff, feeding people, um, changing water to wine, doing these things. And so Nicodemus schedules a meeting with him at night because he's embarrassed, he, he's afraid of what people would think about him as a religious leader meeting with this man who is a religious leader but in a very different way. So here in chapter 3 of John it says, After dark one evening, a Jewish religious leader named Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to speak with Jesus. Teacher, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are proof enough that God is with you. And isn't that an interesting statement that, that he says, whether anybody will, will admit it or not, we all know you're here to teach us. We all know that the things you do are miraculous. But I, I want to know more. I want to get to know you more. And Jesus replied, I assure you, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. And isn't that a strange statement that Nicodemus says, you're here to, you're here to teach, so teach me. And Jesus said, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom. You'll never know God. And so Nicodemus replies, what do you mean? And think about it. If you had never been to church before, if you'd never known this passage before, if you'd never heard the term born again, and that's where Nicodemus is coming from, what do you mean born again? That's, that's very odd. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And he says like that, like the old is the problem, an old man. Like it, that's anybody. You can't put a baby back in the womb. As soon as you're out, you're out. And so he says, what do, you, what do you expect of me? I can't be born again. Jesus replied, the truth is, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. And he says in water, and what he's referencing there, water, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. So don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. Now understand what Jesus has done there for Nicodemus and for us. In one statement, he has stripped away the understanding of God and that we have to be really, really good people, that we have to come to church every Sunday, that we have to give money to the church, that we have to do all the things that people think are good in order to earn our way to God. He takes all that away from this religious leader who spent his entire life doing that. And he says, no matter how devoted you are, no matter how pious you are, it doesn't matter unless you're born again. And Nicodemus is left without hope because he's been told something impossible, something he cannot do. And one of the things that I love about baptism and this topic is that, that baptism is a picture of hope. And that's what this church is about. That's what really Christianity is about. That our, our church is about transforming lives through the hope of Jesus Christ. And how that all comes together is, is a little further down in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
And then it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Jesus didn't come here to leave us without hope. He came to provide hope, to save us. And that's what he says to Nicodemus. God sent me to you to save you, to make you reborn. And that's the the picture of what baptism is is for us, is that baptism is, is showing that we already understand this, that we've already gone to Jesus and said, save me. I'm a sinner. I'm separated from you, from the things I've done wrong. Save me. And we know from scripture that in that moment, Jesus does. That he is there and he's there in person and he does. He saves us. And that's the great hope. And it's a hope that scripture says will not be put to shame. It is a perfect hope that you can pin everything on. And in understanding that, then we go and and Jesus commands us to do this, to go and be baptized, not to wash off sins. There's nothing, there's no bath you can take to wash off sins. There's no long, hot shower you can take that, that washes all that off. There's no pool in the atrium that will, that will take away your sins. But instead what it does is it represents, it's, it's people standing up and saying, I believe in Jesus. I believe he washed away my sins in his blood. And now I want to show everybody who I identify with. I want to show everybody what I believe by being baptized. And so I, I love that thing about baptism. I love that we're, that as, as people who follow Christ, we can stand up and say, this is who I am. I'm not going back to who I was because my hope is in Jesus and I'm making a stand today. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says some things that that I also think are really important for baptism. And I don't know about your background. I don't know who you were. Um, When I think back at high school, I I try not to. (laughs) It was not not the best time for for a lot of us. But, you know, you have the different groups. You have the jocks and you have the the nerds and, and that was more my side of things. Um, I was very geeky and I, I had a few friends, but I never really felt like I fit in. I never really felt like I belonged. And then I went to college and I went to a really geeky college and I thought this is where, you know, it, it'll come through and I'll fit right in. And I didn't really fit in there either. And I realized I fit here. Like I belong here. I belong in this church and I, I belong to Jesus. And, and what I love is in Ephesians 4, 4, it says, we are all one body, we have the same spirit, and we have all been called to the same glorious future. Isn't that neat? That Christ has made us one body. He's made us all connected and tied together. You are one. You belong. There is only one Lord, and that's Jesus. One faith, one baptism, And there's only one God and Father who is over us all and in us all and living through us all. And that's what it means to be a church. There were one people living under one Jesus, the only Jesus, and that he is living in us and all through us and moving around as we do, as we go and take care of the homeless, as we go and take care of the needy, as we are here praying with people who need it, as Our pastors are going over to Portugal to train other pastors. That's all one. And all of our worship and our giving and our sacrifices and our service, it all combines to be one body, unified. And so then later on in Ephesians 4.21, he says, Since you have heard about him and have learned the truth that is in Jesus, throw off your old evil nature and your former way of life, which is rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. Instead, there must be a spiritual renewal of your thoughts and your attitudes. You must display a new nature because you are a new person created in God's likeness, righteous, holy, and true. That's what God does for us. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, he makes us holy, righteous, and true through Jesus. That's the hope and that's the belonging. And so as you're here today, I I hope that's something that's kind of your heartbeat to say, not that I belong within the four walls of this church, but I belong to this church. And the people of this church belong to me because we're all in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, we're made righteous, pure, and holy. And then what he goes on to say, so put away all falsehood and tell your neighbor the truth because we belong to each other. 
we're accountable to each other and we care for each other and we lift up each other and we carry each other. That's what he's talking about here. And then finally in verse 30, it says, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he is the one who has identified you as, your, as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. If you're here today and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then God has marked you as his own. He has said, this is mine and I am claiming it. And what baptism is, is that picture of how we get to that point. That when we're saved, what, what really happens when we decide we're going to follow Jesus and put our faith in him. And what Paul says here is that we put away all the old stuff. We put away all the sin. And the way that Paul puts it in Romans is that that sin, that flesh, that passion, that's all crucified with Jesus. So when we put someone under the water in, that, in, the, in the baptism pool, we say buried in the likeness of his death. So we're taking that picture and we're saying, I am identifying with Jesus on the cross. Not the Jesus that it's really fun to identify with sometimes, and not the ones that, that's over there in the, in the painting, that's painting that's petting a lamb and has children all around him. I'm identifying with him on the cross because he takes my sin off of me and he makes me righteous and pure. So I'm being identified with him. But the great thing about this is when we baptize you, we don't leave you down in the pool. We don't hold you down. We don't drown you. We lift you back up. And we say, buried in the likeness of his death, raised again into newness of life. Because that's the picture that Jesus gives us. That he was on the cross, that he was buried in death, and he rose again through the power of God. And he takes all of our sins, all the, all the bad things, all, the, all that stuff, he takes it with him. And so in that baptism, it isn't something that washes it off. It's a picture. And it's such a beautiful picture. It's a picture, really. It's, a, it's, like, um, it's like a birthday party, in a way. When you think about what he said in John chapter 3, where he says, you must be born again. And we celebrate birthdays every year. That big accomplishment you had that you were born and you didn't really do anything. You're just there. You're present. But everybody celebrates you, right? And somewhere in there, you're supposed to thank your mom because she did all the hard work. But you were born, and you celebrate that anniversary every single year. We have baptism in the Christian faith to celebrate that, that moment that you were reborn, that God did all the work for you, that all you had to do was accept his gift of eternal life. All you had to do was accept Jesus, and that's it. And so we're baptized in obedience to him and to celebrate what he's done in our lives, that we're transformed. We're transformed through hope and we have somewhere that we belong. And that's, that's what I love about it. I love being part of this church because we're one faith following that God. I love having somewhere that I belong, that I know people love me, they care about me. And I know that anyone that I run into that says they're looking for a church, I could say, I have one, Community Bible Church, you'll be loved. And it doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter what you look like. It, none of that matters because we understand that Jesus loves us first. And so I can love other people. I can care about other people that way. So for you here today, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your savior, I invite you to do that today. That when you accept him, when, when you ask him to save you, Understand all that stuff, all the bad things that keep you from God all get washed away in his blood. He made that sacrifice for us and it's done. And now you belong to him. And it's very, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from my sin. Make me your child. But for those of you who have done that and you haven't been baptized yet today, maybe today is today. Maybe today is the day that you make the public declaration, this is who I am, I am with Jesus, I belong to him, and I want to show everyone, I want to show my church, I want to show the world, I want to make that declaration, I'm not who I was, and I'm not going back. And now look, I understand that Bo's not here today, and a lot of you, he's your pastor, and he's the one you look up to, and, and if you want to be baptized by him, I don't blame you a bit, that's fine. He'll be back. We'll do baptisms again. But if today is the day, as soon as I'll, I'm about to pray, I'm going to go change clothes and I'll, I'm going to go out to the pool. 
and I'll be glad to baptize you. It'd be my honor to baptize you to make that public declaration of whose family you're in and where you belong. So as soon as I pray, if you want to stand up and head on out, we've got shorts and shirts for you to wear. We've got towels for you. We've got all that taken care of, and we would love for you to join us in that way. For the rest of us, as soon as the service is over, if you want to crowd out there and surround these people, this is a representation of the best day of that person's life when they met Jesus. And so we want to celebrate with that with them. Every time we have baptisms, celebrate. This is the best birthday party ever. And we want you to be a part of that and celebrate with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderful, wonderful gift of Jesus. Thank you that he sacrificed himself for us, that, that all those things are gone and we're not separated from you anymore. Thank you for loving us, for making us your own, for changing our identity to someone in your family, for adopting us. We can't stop praising your name for that and thanking you for that. We pray for Pastor Bo as he comes home, he and Jason next week, that you would take care of them, that you would protect them and help them to get rested. We pray that if anyone here today doesn't know you, that you would draw them to yourself, that, that you would make it clear how much you love them, that they would understand that. And I pray for those who feel your voice, that they know they, they need to obey in, in baptism, that they will obey you today, that they'll get up and make that declaration. Father, we love you. We lift up all these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen.